Mandarins by Ryunosuke Akutagawa. Sometimes translated to tangerines, but what's in the name? Mikan, right? It is kind of a term that, as my understanding, is Sumatra orange, or it's equated to that. But it's a sweet fruit. Like, let's, let's not get too lost in the semantics. And let's be honest, this isn't a botany channel. This is a literature discussion channel. But the meat in Mikan, that represents kind of like, I think, uh, honey. I think it is. It's, it's, it's sweet. While the second kanji is kind of like meaning uh, it's like a citrus fruit. And is it important for you to know what that means? Well, let's put it this way. When we look at Japan in the late 90s, well after this story was written, it actually took on a little nickname of the Big Mekon for a period of time in terms of Tokyo, right? As you think of New York being the Big Apple, Tokyo was the Big Mekon. Very short period of time afterwards, but it gives you an idea that it's not exactly an obscure fruit. It's a well-known, it's common, right? And it's it means something to the country. Now, this entire story takes place on a train, and maybe I'll show you some pictures from this really awesome uh, collection that I have. And I can't, I can recommend it to you, but unfortunately, it's all in Japanese. But the entire story takes place more or less on a train. This man is fatigued. They say he's kind of suffering from melancholy, and he kind of has this train, the second class train to himself. He's all alone, and he, he kind of likes it. He's kind of surprised by it, I guess I should say, until a lowly country girl comes walking onto that train, right? And at first, he's like, oh, yeah, this country girl, she's got the lusterless hair, not really excited. But it's when we see that she's holding this... Um, third class ticket <gasps> she's sitting on the second class train she clearly hasn't paid to be here you get a little bit of class commentary you get a little bit of looking down on perhaps country folk from from our narrator here and i'm not 100 percent sure how trains worked back then to be honest can't say i was alive back then but i do know like today when you look at the shinkansen you have like a green train you got a second class train like like you get an idea there's a class divide there's a whole show called uh, snowpiercer on hbo and there was even like a movie of it and the whole show was on this premise about class divide within the train too like like trains being symbolically representative of a class divide is not really too far of a stretch and universal across a lot of different cultures i'll say and we get a little bit of political commentary from this 1919 piece, right? So if we think about the year that it's written, 1919, we just finished, we just finished the Spanish flu pandemic. We're kind of in the tail end of World War II, where if you look at this, Akutagawa is well known for being what's called a Taisho writer. Like that's the era in which he wrote, like the emperor era. And it's just after the Meiji era, where Japan was behind when it came to, to their economy, to industrialization. And they somehow took like hundreds of years of industrialization and slammed it into the Meiji era, like in decades. And here's Taisho, where, where people are very confused and there's a, a rapid change in class divide and class structure. Because before, uh, particularly Japan had a lot more of a focus on the farmer and providing class, more so than merchants. Merchants were wealthy, but they were also like the people that focused on money, and money was evil in Japan. Well, here we come into a more modern era, and this man's looking down on her for not having the cash, not having that money for the second class. But at the same time, he doesn't understand her, I don't think. Like, we never see her talk. We never see her... Do we ever see her look at him? I don't think we do. She's, she's always busy. What's with the outside world? Well, he's focused on what's in the train, right? And the man brings a newspaper on this train. It's dimly lit with this artificial light, and he, he can't read it. And I don't think it's meant to be like he physically can't read it. Like his mind can't focus because of what's going on in the world, right? We have this comment where he says uh, problems of peace treaty issues, weddings, some sort of bribery scandal, death notices. So it's like he thinks there's all these society things causing problems for why he can't read. And again, reading is a way of connecting with others a way of understanding other people's thoughts and visions. And this man can't do it, but it's like the only thing he brought on this, this train was the newspaper, but he just can't focus. He can't connect with humanity. He can't connect with the outside world. He's, he's stuck in his train. We have a really interesting quote. At the same time, I was, despite myself, rather conscious of the girl sitting in front of me 
as though she were the personification of coarse reality. So this man, if he's not in reality, what's he doing? (laughs) She's busy trying to connect with the outside world. Well, he's focused on the train, right? Again, she's trying to open the door when he's like, oh, I didn't I didn't even realize she was right next to me. <laughs> like, he's so stuck in his own mind, his own fantasy. He's not stuck in reality. He's not busy trying to connect with other humans. And, you know, she she's struggling with this door, gets it down, the smog comes in, he's coughing. It's like this, we're approaching the climax of the story. Because once he gets through this smog, you know, you think he's going to yell at this girl for opening this window, But that's when he sees the sun. That's when he sees or notices the outside world. And the sun, we can't can't just gloss past that because uh, the land of the rising sun, like even the name, like in Japanese, Nihon, like like rising sun, right? Like like it's in the name of the country. (laughs) But also when you look at like Shinto, like the old way of, of Japan, you had Amaterasu, who was the female goddess of the sun, right? Like, like even just the creed, like the, if we look at the main god that's kind of worshipped there, it's the sun, and it kind of represents Japan, it represents humanity as a whole. And that's when he has this, this vision, this, this epiphany, I should say, actually. And he doesn't explain what it is, right? It's, it's like, it's the Japanese literature approach of dropping description and scene on you, but not explaining kind of like what's going on behind. It's up to us to kind of establish what we think of it. And this girl, she, she reads, she like leads her body out and chucks, whoop, you get, you get some Mekon, you get some Mekon. And she chucks the Sumatra oranges out. And what does that mean? That they're, they're passing these three boys who are receiving them. And, And the narrator again goes back into fantasy of like, oh, I'm sure it's, it's her younger brothers. Like that, that's what it is. And she's the one that actually leaves the train. She's the one that is sharing Sumatra oranges, again, a big country of Japan. She's the one that's opening up the, the windows to the sun. You know, when we think about the Matarasu representing the whole world. She's not afraid of opening up and connecting with the outside world while this man drives further into himself, into the train, into fantasy, creating things without even trying to engage with the outside world. I'm not sure exactly how you guys took everything in the story, but... When we also look at the class element, usually people without as much stuff have less to give. But do they actually do that? Like, are, are like have you ever looked at studies of what does it mean to be giving to others? And here she is, theoretically having not like as not as much, and she's throwing away oranges to to these boys who may or may not know her. Right? She's giving more to others as well as this other man who who has a newspaper he can't even use, and he doesn't even give it away. He just holds on to it, hoards in a sense, that there's a little bit of class thought there, on top of the fact that this man is not able to engage necessarily with the world. And do we view this as his his epiphany, right? Because if we look at the final line, and now for the first time, I was able to forget, at least for a moment, my unspeakable fatigue, my ennui, and with that, this unfathomable, ignoble, and tedious life. So did he escape this whole time we thought he wasn't engaging with life? Is he really just escaping boredom, the tediousness of it? And that's why he withdraws into it. Or has he not learned how to connect with others, how to give, how to not view things at face value in terms of this country bumpkin, in terms of the class divide and how she's trying to rise up a level? If you would just open up and see people for who they really are. It's a good story. I love Akutagawa. Obviously, all of his stories have connected with me on a different level. But this is one that really, I think, paints more of the impressionistic emotional feel for a lot of Japanese literature. Even though, you know, he studied Chinese arts, even though he's studied a lot of the old monogatari, that he really has this unique ability to shift his style. And this is, I think, one of the pieces from Akutagawa's uh, over that really demonstrate the uh, almost like Yasunari Kawabata feel. Like if you've ever read Snow Country, there's, there's even like when they're driving through the mountains of Snow Country, which was written after this, mind you, by the way, where they talk about like, oh, those mountains, those those represent the passing of time. Like he just hits you in the face with the metaphor. And here he is with this girl saying like, oh, she represents reality. <laughs> 
and, you know, we get to have some fun discussion about uh, what what is this man, you know, the tediousness of life. Like, why is he escaping reality? Why does he draw into himself, and what does that cause him to miss out on? Right in terms of the joy this girl saw with the sun, the matarasu representing Japan, with with the sharing of these oranges with the boys, I think it's a good discussion piece of when you do withdraw into yourself, what do you miss out on in life, and do we see something from a, like literally like the most minute and weirdest plot in a story can come off as absolutely gorgeous writing. So, playlist down below for other Akutagawa talks. One of my favorite authors, if not top five. What do you guys think of this story? What other short stories by Akutagawa would you love to see me talk about or explore next? We look forward to hearing from you in the comments. Una, peace out.